Welcome to the oral presentation session BNT cells from basic to clinical immunology. We will start with an invited lecture from Professor Federica Salustro from ETH Zurich, where she works in the Institute of Microbiology. Her lab is focused on the understanding of the mechanisms that control T cell priming and regulation of cytokine production and homing capacities. The title of her lecture will be T cell plasticity and commitment in human. Her lecture is followed by six oral presentations of selected abstracts. The first abstract will be presented by Dr. Games Diaz from the University Medical Center in Freiburg and is about how LRBA facilitates autophagy through the binding to PIK3R4. This presentation is followed by Dr. Rosman Hinho from the University of Lisbon, which is about the expression of signature of human CD4 single positive regulatory T thymocytes and its modulation by the chromatin landscape. The third presentation is by Dr. Ransavola from Imperial College of London, who will present the study results that are indicative that mutations in ARP C1B trigger CTL activation induced immunodeficiency. Subsequently, Professor Marta Ricci from the University Medical Center in Freiburg will present her results on non apoptotic FES signaling, which controls CD40 dependent mTOR activation and human B cell fate via P10 nuclear exclusion. The presentation of Dr. Vincetto from Padua is more clinically oriented. This presentation is about GLILT as severe complication of CVID, which is reported in about 20% of cases. During the last presentation, Dr. Mer from the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute for Rare and Undiagnosed Diseases from Vienna will present the genomic spectrum and phenotypic heterogeneity of human IL-21 receptor deficiency. With these seven speakers, I think we have a very interesting session. And at around 3.30, we will start with a live Q&A chat for which you are more than welcome to participate and to ask your questions. Please enjoy this session. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Federica Sallusto. And I'd like to start by expressing my appreciation for having the possibility to share our work on human T cell commitment uh, and plasticity with you today. Uh, and in particular, I'd like to discuss with you uh, some work uh, we have been doing on heterogeneity of memory T cells um, uh, in immunodeficiency. So these are my faculty disclosures. Um, and the whole heterogeneity is a hallmark of a factor in memory T cells that best serves the function of providing tailor mechanisms of protection against the different pathogen in different tissues. And upon pathogen recognition, CD4 T cells make effector choices to become Th1, Th2 or Th17 cells under the influence of uh, uh, distance signaling and lineage defining transcription factors. In addition to diversity in the cytokine they produce, effector Th1, Th2 and Th17 cells also exhibit diversity in the expression of homing receptors, and in particular chemokine receptors which regulate their migration in inflamed tissues and can be used as convenient surface marker. For instance, the chemokine receptor CCR3 is expressed on interferon gamma Th1 cells, uh, CCR4 is expressed on L4 producing Th2 cells, and CCR6 uh, was found uh, to be expressed on L17 producing Th17 cells. And by combining the analysis of chemokine receptors and cytokine repertoire, we found that CCR6 is expressed also not only on TH17 cells, but also on a subset of interferon gamma producing TH1 cells that were defined as non classic TH1 or TH1 star. And um, uh, we found that while the 6 3 positive Th1 subset is enriched in specificity against the viral antigens, the 6 3 positive, CCR6 positive subset is enriched in specificity against intracellular bacteria, and in particular, 
uh, mycobacteria. And uh, studies in patients uh, with inherited deficiency in ROR gamma T, which is the transcription factor required for TH17 differentiation, um, provided evidence that uh, this transcription factor is also required for the differentiation of TH1 star, uh, but not TH1 cell. And these findings uh, indicate that there are still outstanding open questions on how uh, interferon gamma production is regulated in human T cells. Uh, more recently, um, the uh, group of Jean-Laurent Casanova has reported a patient with the mycobacterial uh, disease due to inherited deficiency of the transcription factor TBET. And TBET governs the development of function of several interferon gamma producing lymphocytes in mice, including TH1 cells. And in the patient, uh, the TBET deficiency resulted in several defects in NK cells and other innate like lymphocytes and strongly reduced production of interferon gamma by NK cells and CD4 T cells. And this is due to the inability of the mutant TBET to bind the DNA in dry gene transcription. And this is really a beautiful work that has been done by a postdoc in Jean Laurent's lab, uh, Ray Young. So uh, in this study, we analyzed uh, um, in the TBET patient the antigen-specific T cell response to viral uh, and bacterial antigens uh, using the T cell library approach for the high throughput interrogation of memory T cells primed in vivo. And um, what we did was to isolate two subsets of memory T cells based on the expression of CCR6. The CCR6 positive subset contains uh, TH1 star and TH17, and the CCR6 negative subset uh, contains TH1 and TH2. And um, when we tested uh, the ability of the CCR6 negative TH1 cells uh, to respond to viral antigens, in particular uh, influenza virus uh, and um, uh, Epstein Barr virus, we found that um, there are uh, indeed the T cells proliferating uh, in response to these antigens to level comparable to the wild type controls or to the heterozygous. Uh, however, while proliferating, uh, the T cells from the patient uh, did not produce interferon gamma, which was uh, somehow uh, as expected. Um, when we instead uh, uh, tested the ability of the CCR6 positive TH1 star cells to respond to microbacterial antigens, in particular uh, to BCG, we found that there was a large proportion of cells responding to these antigens, and while doing so, the cells did produce uh, interferon gamma to level comparable to the controls. Uh, the only difference being uh, that uh, the T-cells from the patient, uh, at least uh, some of them, uh, could also produce L17, which is not, not uh, seen in the, in the controls. So, uh, in spite of an overall defect in interferon gamma production, it seems that rare interferon gamma producing TH1 cells can be detected in the patient, especially in the context of the response to uh, mycobacteria. And these findings uh, um, gave us the opportunity to ask a more general question on the mechanism driving interferon gamma production in human T cells in the absence of TBET. And this is uh, the work that has been done in the lab by a PhD student, uh, Mark Weiser, in close collaboration with Ray Young uh, and Jean-Laurent Casanova. So what uh, Mark did was to obtain a PBMC sample uh, from the Tibet deficient patient and perform a different type of assay. Um, uh, he performed single cell RNA-seq on resting and activated the CD4 T cells, um, straight after isolation uh, from blood. Uh, then uh, he isolated several um, single T cell clones from memory subsets for their characterization, including attack seq And finally, he took advantage of the CRISPR-Cas9 technology to, um, to uh, knock out the genes in memory uh, NAE T cells. So the single uh, uh, cell RNA-seq uh, uh, performed on resting and activated uh, CD4 T cells, uh, isolated ex vivo, um, show that uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the patient, uh, there is in fact a very strong uh, deficit in interferon gamma production. Uh, you see that interferon gamma is indeed uh, the gene um, more differentially expressed in this comparative analysis. However, um, even in this uh, sample, a few uh, T cells um, were able to produce uh, uh, interferon gamma, and some of them actually at levels 
that uh, um, is uh, comparable to the uh, levels uh, detected in the wild type control. So by gauging on interferon gamma positive uh, cells, we could ask what are the genes which are differentially expressed in the interferon gamma producing T cells uh, in the patient compared to the control. And uh, uh, by doing so, we identified the several genes which are differentially expressed. And among the most differentially expressed genes, we identified homozodermin that, as you can see, is expressed on higher frequency of interferon gamma producing T cells in the patient. So to further assess uh, the expression of the OMS, uh, we sorted interferon gamma producing T cells from uh, control and the patient. Uh, there are, of course, a few uh, of these cells in the patient compared to the control. And we sorted these cells using the cytokine secretion assay, which, as you can see here, uh, works uh, uh, quite well in isolating interferon gamma mRNA positive cells. So we could then assess what was the genes uh, uh, differentially expressed in these samples and found that uh, in both CCR6 positive interferon gamma positive Th1 cells, as well as CCR6 negative interferon gamma positive Th1 cells, amesodermine was in fact differentially expressed and expressed in a higher frequency of the positive cells in the patient compared to control. So, um, altogether, uh, uh, the emosodermin um, can be uh, an interesting candidate because um, it's a paralog of Tibet, uh, which was already found to be induced in mouse ADAT cells and be sufficient to induce interferon gamma production together with perforin and granzyme B. Um, the role of GOMS uh, in, uh, in humans uh, is, uh, is uh, less clear. Uh, it has been shown that um, it can play a role uh, in, uh, um, in driving the differentiation of the TH1 star from TH17. Uh, and uh, also um, in other studies uh, shown to promote the differentiation of um, ten producing uh, TR1 cells. So, as a next step, uh, step uh, we isolated uh, several T cell clones uh, from uh, memory CCR6 negative and CCR6 positive subset uh, from wild type and Tibet deficient patient, um, and uh, identified uh, two clear types of T cell clones uh, in Tibet, Tibet deficiency, those producing low level of interferon gamma, and those instead producing high level of interferon gamma, very much uh, to level comparable to the uh, TH1 uh, wild type uh, Tibet sufficient uh, T cell clones. And um, as shown here, there was a striking uh, correlation between interferon gamma production uh, and uh, EOMS expression. Although uh, it is also interesting to observe that uh, there are a few interferon gamma producing T cell clones that do not express EOMS. So we then performed uh, attack seek analysis on the different type of uh, T cell clones and uh, found that the chromatin accessibility at the interferon gamma locus had a comparable pattern in interferon gamma positive clones from both well type and control, uh, while the locus uh, was not accessible in the interferon gamma negative clones isolated from the uh, Tb deficient patient. Uh, and this analysis is really helping us defining possible candidate genes which can drive uh, uh, interferon gamma expression in Tibet deficiency. Uh, but already the um, analysis of uh, uh, the, especially the um, uh, accessible, uh, the, the sequence motif uh, in accessible regions point to a role of OMS uh, as a likely candidate. So really the question is um, now, whether EOMS expression is sufficient to induce interferon gamma production in Tibet deficient T cells. And to address this question, uh, we use two different lentiviral vectors to overexpress EOMS in interferon gamma negative T cell clones um, from Tibet deficient patient. And in both settings, as you can see, uh, EOMS is expressed on a sizable proportion of cells. So um, EOMS uh, uh, overexpression is in fact uh, sufficient uh, to induce interferon gamma production in uh, uh, interferon gamma negative T cell clones. Um, as uh, uh, you can see here, um, the clones, uh, up to 70% of the clones can indeed 
uh, upon overexpression of OMS, uh, start producing interferon gamma. So uh, the, the next question was whether the OMS deletion instead affect interferon gamma production in Tibet deficient uh, T cells. Um, and we do, to address this question, what uh, we uh, used, uh, we, uh, we used the CRISPR-Cas9 technology to knock out OMS in memory T cell clones. Um, as you can see here, uh, this um, um, strategy uh, indeed uh, was sufficient to, um, was, uh, was good to uh, eliminate OMS in T cell clones. And in this condition, however, we found that um, the um, knockout of OMS uh, was not affecting the ability of the clones to produce uh, interferon gamma. So, uh, in condition of very efficient EMS gene knockout, the clones are still uh, produce interferon gamma. So, to sum up the data obtained so far, we can say that rare interferon gamma uh, positive uh, uh, T cells are detected in vivo in the Tibet uh, deficient patient. These cells express EOMS, uh, and EOMS overexpression is sufficient to induce interferon gamma production in the absence of Tibet. However, memory T cells from the Tibet deficient patient do not require continuous expression of EOMS uh, for interferon gamma production. At this point, I need to uh, remind that uh, um, T cell differentiation is a continuous process uh, that generates intermediate as well as thermally differentiated uh, effector cells. And that within this spectrum of differentiation, um, the cells may have a different degree of plasticity of commitment. And therefore, um, the requirements for transcription factors may differ at different stages of differentiation. So we therefore asked whether AOMS is required in the early stages of T-cell differentiation. And to do so, we isolated uh, naive T-cells from the Tibet-deficient patient and white eye control and primed them in vitro using autologous antigen-presenting cells and microbacterium as a source of antigens and innate stimuli. Under this condition, uh, naive uh, MTB-specific T-cells can be primed, and in the case of the wild type control, they very effectively differentiate into interferon gamma producing Th1 star cells. Uh, the interferon gamma positive cells, as you can see here, uh, they very much express high level of uh, Tbet, and some of them, uh, even in the uh, wild type um, control, express mesodermy. Uh, the naive T cell from the patient could also be primed although in this condition only few can uh, acquire the ability to produce interferon gamma. Uh, these cells do not express Tibet, but uh, interestingly, they all express a very high level of uh, erosodermine. Um, so at this point, we used uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 to knock out uh, uh, erosodermine in these early stages of T-cell differentiation and found that indeed the mesoderm is required for the acquisition of interferon gamma producing capacity by the naive T cell primed in vitro with MTB. Uh, as you can see here, the uh, cells in the absence of OMS and Tibet are very much uh, impaired in their ability to produce interferon gamma. And this is so also in the case of Tibet sufficient T cells, there is a reduction in the ability of uh, uh, the T cells to acquire interferon gamma producing capacity. It is also interesting to see that uh, if you uh, Tibet deficient T cells primed in vitro become independent of OMS expression, very much as the memory T cells uh, primed uh, in vivo. So uh, to sum up, uh, this uh, uh, data would suggest that in the early stages of T-cell differentiation, EMS is required to induce or maintain interferon gamma production in Tibet deficient and possibly as well as in Tibet sufficient uh, T-cells. So altogether, uh, the data I presented to you today show that studies of genetic defects uh, give us the opportunity to define a new mechanism 
and pathways of T-cell differentiation in humans and to address the role of different T-cell subsets in host defense. Uh, and there are a number of uh, mutations that have been described in the context of that impact on uh, the uh, TH1 or TH17 pathways um, that are interesting to study and that can reveal um, these new uh, mechanisms and pathways of T-cell differentiation in humans. And this is something we are very much interested to, to explore um, in collaboration with Jean-Laurent Casanova and Puel and Jacinta Bustamante. And with this, I close uh, by thanking the people that um, uh, have done the work, in particular Mike Baser in, uh, in Zurich, uh, that has been helped by many other people in the labs in Zurich and in Bellinzona. Uh, Samuele Notarbarto, a former member in the lab, um, helped a lot uh, for the attack seek and single cell and sick data. All the work was done thanks to the great collaboration with Jean-Laurent Casanova uh, lab uh, uh, in Paris and in, uh, in New York, um, also together with Ampuel and Jacinta Bustamante. We received some help from Manfred Klassen and Dario Cerletti in Zurich and from different people in Bellinzona, in particular Matilde Foglierini and David Gerossi. I thank also the funding and um, I thank you for your attention and uh, may take any question uh, that you have. Hi, my name is Laura Gámez Díaz. I'm a postdoc at the Center for Chronic Immunodeficiency in Freiburg, Germany. And today I would like to share with you our data supporting that LRBA facilitates autophagy to the binding to PIK3R4. I have nothing to disclose. LRBA, which stands for LPS Responsive Page Like Anchor Protein, belongs to the BISH domain containing protein family along with eight other human proteins. They are characterized by having a BISH domain and a WD40 domain at the C terminal portion of the protein. In the particular case of LRBA that is broadly expressed in human tissues, immune cells need to be activated in order to express the protein. Back in 2012, our group reported that biallelic mutations in LRBA causes a primary immunodeficiency known as LRBA deficiency. Regardless the type of the mutation or the location of the mutation in LRBA gene, most cases lead to the abolishment or reduction of the protein expression that can be validated by Western blood or fax analysis. Due to this, there is a lack of the genotype-phenotype correlation in LRBA deficiency. Besides being a primary immunodeficiency, LRBA deficiency is also immune dysregulation syndrome since most of the patients present with immune dysregulation where enteropathy and autoimmune hemolytic anemia are the most frequent autoimmune manifestations that we have seen. And this is explained uh, by the fact that LRBA regulates CTL4 trafficking back to the surface membrane of the regulatory T cells where CTL4 all competes to C28 to bind the CD80, CD86 expressed in the APCs, engulf that in a vesicle and leading that to degradation. Through this mechanism, regulatory T cells can control the T cell activation. However, in the particular case where LRBA is absent, like in LRBA deficiency, CTL4 cannot recycle back to the surface membrane, but instead it goes for lysosomal degradation, producing an overall low numbers of CTL4 in the membrane. And they, that is why the patients present with so much autoimmunity and their clinical manifestations in general overlap with the CTL4 insufficiency patients. However, LRBA deficient patients also present with hypogammaglobulinemia that is leading to the high frequency of the recurrent infections and mostly from the upper respiratory tract. Therefore, our research question was what is the role of LRBA in B cells? Because patients also present with reduced number of switch memory B cells and most of them had no plasma blasts. And in addition to that, LRBA expression is mostly found in B cells 
in comparison to the other PBMC subsets after stimulation. So the first approach that we use was computational predictions in order to identify LRBA interaction partners in B cells. And we did so by analyzing that through FUNC-based and STRING, which are free uh, databases. And after a GO analysis, we observed that those proteins identified, we were 27, are mostly biologically involved in autophagy, but also lysosome formation. After the validation of seven of those 27 proteins, we find out that LRBA is in close proximity with PIK3R4 in B cells from a healthy donor that you can see here as a red signal. This signal was lost when we evaluated in LRBA deficient patients. PIK3R4 is the member of the pediatric kinase complex 3 together with BPS34 and Beclin1 and all together are important for a for autophagy. Autophagy is a catabolic uh, mechanism that cells use to survive under stress conditions, and it does so by forming a double membrane vesicle known as autophagosome that will later fuse with lysosome in order to degrade all the organelles or proteins that the cells are not needing into the lysosome. And pediatric kinase complex 3 by the production of PI3P is important for the formation of the autophagosome, but also for the step of the fusion of the autophagosome and lysosome. Therefore, in um, HeLa cells control and knockdown for LRBA, we evaluated the production of PI3P, and we observed here in red that in the absence of LRBA, there is a very low production of PI3P in comparison to the control HeLa cells. In addition, we observed a reduce of LC3 which is an autophagosomal marker in absence of LRBA in comparison to the control. And this goes in line with the accumulation of P62, which is a cargo protein uh, observed in the absence of LRBA. Additionally, after transfecting HeLa cells with the LRBA LC3 plasmid, we observed that a uh, knockdown HeLa cells, LRBA HeLa cells, can form autophagosomal autophagosomes are bigger than the autophagosomes formed in the wild type HeLa cells. When we check at the lysosomal posi positioning, we observed that um, the lysosomes in the absence of LRBA were all distributed through the cytosol in contrast to the perinuclear location that we observed in the wild type HeLa cells. When we look at the electromicroscopy in B cells, from mice, Walter mice, and LRBA knockout mice before and after stimulation with LPS, we observed in the absence of LRBA an accumulation of autophagosomes and lysosomes. In addition, we also saw that LRBA localized inside the autophagosomes once the B cells are stimulated with LPS. So all these data together let us know that it's an abnormal autophagy happening in the absence of LRBA. And this is correlated to the reduced survival or high apoptosis that we have seen previously in the B cells from our patients, but also in the absence of plasma blasts when we try to differentiate B cells in vitro. And this is supported by previous findings uh, from 2014 showing or demonstrating that autophagy is an essential process needed for the B cells to differentiate into plasma blasts. Finally, when we evaluate the mTOR activity by Western blood in EBB cells uh, from healthy donor and patient and HeLa cells, what type and lacking LRBA, we observed that there was a hyperphosphorylation of the six kinase in the absence of LRBA in comparison to the wild type controls, in addition to a hyperphosphorylation of the MPK. These proteins or this signaling cascade, it is important for or the initiation of autophagy. All these data together suggest or uh, contribute to the abnormality of autophagy. So the take home message for today uh, is that LRBA interacts with pediatric kinase 4 and this interaction facilitates the production of PI2P that would finally allow the fusion of the autophagosome with the lysosome. However, whenever LRBA is not absent, 
in the autophagus, some which have already engulfed the protein, the cargo proteins and the organelles to be degraded, will be accumulated in the cytosol, will increase the size of the autophagosomes, uh, leading to a reduced overall autophagy and increased apoptosis of the B cells, leading to low plasma cell numbers, low immunoglobulin titers, and finally, to the high frequency of the recurrent infections like we see in our LRBA deficient patients. With this, I would like to uh, say thanks to uh, the Age Greenbach group in Freiburg, to all our collaborators, physician patients controls, and of course to you for your attention. Thank you. So, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Pedro Osmaniño, and today I'm going to talk about the signature of human CD4 regulatory thymocytes and its modulation by the chromatin landscape. Uh, uh, first, I would like to mention that I do not have anything to disclose. So, regulatory T cells are key players in maintaining immune homeostasis. And in this way, they are crucially important for the control of immunopathologies associated with immunity against pathogens and cancer, as well as for the prevention of allergy autoimmune diseases, and chronic inflammation. Although Tregs can also be generated in the periphery during immune responses, they are usually committed in the thymus, uh, being known as thymic Tregs. Uh, they are enriched in self-reactive T-cell receptors, and thus they are particularly important for the prevention of autoimmunity. Therefore, it is of the utmost importance to understand how this population is generated. Thus, we want, we want to do this, we want to understand which are the factors that are involved in time to react development and, and, and commitment. Mainly, we want to understand what is the transcriptional signature of time to react and how does the chromatin landscape profile of these cells influences the thymic T-Rex signature, making them distinct from the thymic T-Combs. So, to do this, we, to study this, we generated the human thymic T-Rex and thymic t comp CD4 single positive transcriptional signatures from three human, from cells obtained from three human healthy thymuses uh, with normal T-cell development. Uh, from this uh, expression profile, we obtained um, a list of the 836 genes that are upregulated in thymic t -reg, including genes typical of the thymic t signature, such as FOXP3 and CTLA4. Furthermore, we also generated the, the accessible chromatin profiles of both, these, both of these populations. Uh, Afterwards, we observe, interestingly, that the thymic t rex signature, uh, expression signature, correlates with an increase in chromatin accessibility in this same signature. Uh, afterwards, we want to check the association that, uh, of the opening and closing of the regulatory regions of these of this, uh, of this cells uh, with the differential expression. So, we observed that the accessible chromatin regions associated with uh, the differentially expressed genes uh, are mostly uh, enriched in promoter regions compared to the feature distribution of all the accessible chromatin regions. Afterwards, we performed the we we observed that there is an enrichment of the thymic T-reg regulated genes in all marked gene sets that are characteristic of these of these uh, of these T cells. Uh, then we went to associate each expression module of these expression modules with distinct genomic features to see if there's an association with specific regulatory regions. Uh, we observed that there is a consistent increase in chromatin opening at the regulatory regions, which in all of these, uh, in the regulatory regions of these gene signatures, 
and the, that is consistent increase in chromatin opening in the tiny T rex cells compared to tiny T combs is mostly explained by an increased accessibility in promoter regions. Thus, we then went to look for the enriched motifs in the promoters more accessible in T-Rex um, amongst the gene sets that are enriched for our genes in the, in, in the T-Rex signature. So we focused on the, on the upregulated genes associated with the, T, with the TNF alpha signaling via an NFK beta gene set. And we want to find then the DNA motifs that the promoters that are controlling their expression. Interestingly, we found that these, um, that they are enriched for N5 and DF7 binding sites. And we also uh, saw uh, an overrepresentation of the TBP uh, binding sites. Since TBP is a subunit of the, of the transcription of the general transcription factor TF2D. Uh, which is the first protein to bind DNA during the formation of the RNA, RNA pool 2 complex. Uh, this, in the, this is um, an indicator of active promoter sites also. So um, then uh, we went, went to check our list of transcription factors upregulated in, in the T-Rex signature for candidates that could bind to these motifs that we found. Uh, although the NFAT5 and DIR7 are not um, overexpressed uh, in TREC compared to TCOM, they do, they do interact with the main transcription factor models of the tiny TREC signature. Um, and because these transcription factors that are upregulated in TREC form this interactive network of functional modules. And NFAT5 and DIR7 interact with several of the transcription factors uh, uh, that are present in these modules. So as for concluding remarks, um, I would say that uh, I would like to say that we generated the first genome-wide expression and chromatin, chromatin accessibility uh, data uh, in human CD4 single positive tiny T Rex and T combs. With this, we observed that there is an increased chromatin uh, in chromatin accessibility in T Rex, uh, which correlates with expression of regulation. And we also saw that accessibility at promoters identifies regulatory networks of the tiny T Rex signature. Uh, so finally, I would like to thank uh, the members of my of uh, my lab, the Human Immunodeficiency and Immune Reconstitution Lab, uh, headed by Anna Spada de Souza. Uh, the main uh, inter uh, the main collaborative people that work in this project uh, include Alexandre Raposo, uh, Catarina Godin Santos, and Susana Paz, and past members of the lab. Uh, uh, such as Miguel Angel Diaz, Elena Nunes Cabas, and Yumi Tokunaga. And I would like to thank you all for, uh, for listening to my talk. And uh, so have a good afternoon. Hello everyone, my name is Lira, and today I'm going to share with you the works of our lab on the biology of cytotoxic T lymphocytes and how they contribute to hap one b immunodeficiency. I have nothing to disclose and uh, you can write your question in the uh, chat box and we will address them during the live uh, Q&A session at the end of my presentation. So. Work of our lab have shown that uh, filamentous reorganization is pivotal for cytotoxic T lymphocytes, not only for their migration when they are patrolling our body, but also for the recognition of target cells and uh, the specific killing of target cells. 
And filamentous actin polymerization relies on the activity of a nucleation promoter factor up to three. And in mammals, uh, some subunit of the up to three complex has two isoforms like the APC1 subunit, with APC1A being ubiquitous and APC1B is hemopoietic specific. So recently, a mutation in the APC1B subunit uh, led to immunodeficiency. And the first APC1B patient was described by Professor Coopers, with whom who collaborate. And the APC1B patient presented with clinical manifestation of severe inflammation and allergies. And what was of particular interest to us was the low CD8 uh, count and the lamilipogial defect that were reported, which suggests that cytolytic activity may be compromised in this APC1B patient. First, I look at the actin reorganization uh, in a CTL derived from l donor or APC1B patient cells. And we can see that the l donor CTLs is uh, sprayed and forms a dense ring of uh, branch actin upon CD3 stimulation, and this lamellipodial uh, actin is lost in a PC1B patient, which instead present with long filopodia and has a, a significantly low actin intensity. And when I looked at the behavior of the cells uh, with live cell imaging of cells expressing the actin marker life act in red, we can see that l donor uh, cells actively interact uh, with the targets ruffling its actin cytoskeleton, while the APC1B patient uh, cells adopt a strikingly different behavior with a long filobota extending towards the target. And while well, the um, l donor remains firmly attached to the target throughout the movie, the APC1B patient fails to do so. And there's two first uh, results suggest that uh, APC1B is required for target recognition and uh, uh, so for TCI signaling. So not surprisingly then, we um, receive uh, both signaling and secretion are reduced in APC1B patients compared to l donor and it leads to a killing defect. But it's not that straightforward as uh, I realized during this project that L4 had purified the cells to only keep uh, the CD8 positive cells. I, in APC1B patients, I always ended up with a proportion of the cells that do not have CD8 and here they are also negative for TCR. And when I look under the microscope, I noticed that in l donor CD8 could be seen at the membrane and intracellularly, while in APC1B patient, we could barely see any CD8 on the membrane, but instead we can see punctate of CD8 in the cytoplasm. And the cells that have lost CD8 on the membrane are uh, still expressed perforin. So how can we explain that? So it is known that up to three is involved in receptor recycling. For example, it is known that upon activation, TCR is internalized, traffic through the recycling on the zone and uh, uh, recycle back to the plasma membrane. And this is possible for the collaboration on the nucleation promoter factor WASH uh, with the retroma recycling machinery, which allows for the uh, endosomal fission of the tubule and uh, the transport of the TCR back to the plasma membrane. So we asked whether recycling uh, may be defective in APC1B uh, deficient patients. So we needed a universal cargo of uh, retromer wash recycling machinery that could be used as a readout for a potential recycling defect. And one such a cargo is the glucose transporter GLUT1. 
So when we stain the cells for GLUT1, we can see that in healthy donor, GLUT1 is expressed at the plasma membrane and intracellularly. But in APC1B patient, we could only see a discrete punctate of GLUT1 intracellularly, colocalizing with EA1. And this result suggests that indeed we do have a retroma recycling defect as both CD8 and GLUT1 are lost from the plasma membrane. So how does it work then? So it is known that TCR activation leads to proliferation and receptor recycling. And in the context of APC1B uh, deficiency, uh, the cells that have lost GLUT1 and TCR for the plasma membrane due to the recycling defect will be lost upon proliferation. And this is exactly what we observed when we look at the CD8 population over the course of three rounds of restimulation. We can see that in a healthy donor, the CD8 population increases when they are re-stimulated, but in APC1B patient, the CD8 population decreases, and by the third stimulation, we are left with barely any CD8 T cells. And this is the basis of what we propose to call a CTL activation induced immunodeficiency. So to conclude, uh, we have shown that absence of APC1B lead to a loss of CD8 cytotoxicity with a defect arising at two levels. First, the defect in the immune synapse maintenance and function, but a more profound defect arises as a result of the impaired uh, retroma recycling of key receptors for CDL, including GLUT1 and TCR, and this account for the immunological manifestation that we see in APC1B immunodeficiency. So I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any question. Good morning, everybody. Here is Marta Rizzi from the University Medical Center in Freiburg. And I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to share with you what we learned on the FAS uh, studying uh, ALPS patients and its new role in controlling CD40 dependent uh, mTOR activity in B cells. I have nothing to disclose. Autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome, ALPS, is characterized by lymphoproliferation and autoantibody uh, mediated cytopenias. From the laboratory point of view, we find increased vitamin B12, increased soluble fast lichen, uh, expansion of double negative T cells, defective fast lichen induced apoptosis in patients uh, produce blast, and heterozygous mutation in FAST in about 70% of the patients. Patients also show T lymphocytosis, B lymphocytosis, and polyclonal hypergamma globulinemia. If we look in the blood, we find an altered distribution of B cell subpopulation. In particular, we find a reduced marginal zone B cells, reduced switch memory B cells, and normal number of plasma blasts. We also studied the germinal center selection of these patients by studying patients with somatic mutation in FAS and found that the uh, selection of pieces is, um, is compromised in ALPS patients as shown here by the persistence of polyreactive specificity in the memory compartment, which are normally uh, eliminated in the memory compartment of LT control. So we asked the question if uh, this altered distribution of, of pieces in periphery, so the reduced number of memory cells and the altered selection is due only to defective apoptosis or can be also due to other function of FAS, which we may still uh, not know. Indeed, the FAS is a member of the TNF receptor superfamily, uh, which once binds to FAS like and uh, recruits uh, molecules to the intracellular portion to form the disc and activates execution of cast spaces to induce apoptosis in the cells. But it's also known as other member of the TNF receptor superfamily that FAS can induce non-apoptotic signaling. So we asked the question if non-apoptotic signaling may play a role in the pathogenesis uh, of this phenotype in ALPS. In this, indeed, FAS is not expressed on resting B cells, but is readily expressed upon activation. 
And all cells which, exp which express FAS also bind FAS ligand. You can see it here. A pan binding of FAS ligand, though only a proportion of the cells activate CAS base 3, you can see it here, while other cells do not undergo apoptosis and do not activate CAS base 3 also at later time point. So we asked the question what happens uh, as a consequence of signaling of FAS ligand in these cells which do not undergo apoptosis. We took an unbiased approach and looked uh, by mass cytometry in the CAS base 3 PARP negative cells, non apoptotic cells, these are primary cells. Uh, stimulated with CD40 ligand and pulsed with, so, with, with FAS ligand. And we found that in the non-apoptotic cells, uh, we found a modulation uh, of the mTOR signaling pathway here with reduction of phosphorylated AKT and phosphorylated AKC, AK, um, A6, uh, indicating that FAS can modulate mTOR signaling. We confirm this data by conventional flow cytometry. You can see that phosphorylated A6 is induced by CD40 activation in normal B cells and modulated in a dose-dependent manner by FAS ligand. And this uh, modulation is absent uh, in B cells uh, of ALPS patients, indicating that uh, this uh, system may be defective in ALPS patients. To confirm this data in a more physiological way, we look at secondary lymphoid organs where B cells are normally activated. And we look at the intrinsic signaling of, this, of B cells there. We look by mass cytometry, looking at all these signaling pathways in each and every single cell, and found that indeed in germinal center and in plasma blast of ALPS patients, uh, mTOR activation was increased compared to uh, LT cells indicating and suggesting that indeed FAS may control mTOR activation in B cells and plasma plasma. How FAS may control mTOR activation? To understand that, we perform a proteomics study on primary normal B cells, naive B cells, stimulated with CD40 ligand in presence of not of FAS ligand. Uh, we found uh, several proteins which were upregulated in FAS ligand treated cells, and in particular, we concentrated on a ubiquitinase USP7, which is known co to control. Uh, P10 uh, ubiquitination. And this USP7 is linked to FAS via DAX and uh, um, that is recruited to the intracellular portion of FAS. In the current model, in a CD40 ligand activated B cells, the PI3K AKT mTOR uh, signaling pathway is induced and P10 is uh, uh, sequestered in the nucleus because we, in the nucleus because U is ubiquitinate related. Once FAS ligand binds to FAS, DAX, which controls the activity of USP7, is recruited to the intracellular portion of FAS. USP7 can deubiquitinate P10, that can then migrate to the cytoplasm and counteract PI3K activity. To prove this, we looked by immunofluorescence at P10 uh, staining, and in CD40 activated cells, you can see that P10 is mainly in the nucleus, and once FAS ligand is added to the culture, you can see that P10 translocates into the cytoplasm, and here you see the quantification. So we found that uh, FAS can uh, regulate uh, mTOR activation, a new role of FAS in the regulation of, uh, um, of uh, mTOR activation. Inactivated pieces, high level of PI3K AKT can rapidly induce plasma cell formation. Modulation of mTOR activation is necessary to induce MIC and plasma and germinal center formation and the formation of high affinity plasma cells and switch memory cells. And we think that FAS contributes as an inhibitory signal um, in the early phase of activity. In ALPS patients, therefore, the absence of uh, uh, FAS signaling will uh, um, preferentially induce high level of PI3K and T, mTOR, and high plasma cell activity and uh, uh, immunoglobulin secretion, while uh, the germinal center formation will be slightly impaired with a reduced number of memory cell formation. That is what we observe indeed in the phenotype of the patients. So thanks to ALPS, we discover a new role of FAS in the modulation of B cell activation and in the fate, fate um, decision uh, in B cell development. 
With that, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, all my collaborators, especially Julian Staniak here, the PhD student that performed uh, uh, all the experiment, Tomasz Kalina from Frag for uh, uh, the mass cytometry experiment, uh, Manuel Fuentes from Salamanca for uh, the proteomics, uh, all our uh, European uh, collaborators for uh, uh, the contributions of patients' material, and of course you for your attention, I'll be happy to answer questions. Good morning, everybody. My name is Francesco Cinetto from the University of Padova, Italy. Please consider that this is a recorded session. Uh, you will have the chance to put uh, um, uh, questions through the button on the top right corner of the screen, and the answers will be given uh, in the live session at the end of the whole session. Uh, this is These are my disclosures, but you have nothing to disclose in relation to the present speech. And we are going to talk about granulomatous lymphocytic interstitial lung disease, which is actually a distinct clinical radio and pathological ILD occurring in common variable immunodeficiency patients, which is characterized by the double features of granulomatous inflammation and polyclonal lymphoproliferation in all forms of pulmonary lymphoid hyperplasia. Uh, this is a disease classified as an interstitial lung disease, but actually it's often part of a, a systemic disease, possibly involving other organs and tissue. Uh, considering that uh, um, universally accepted diagnostic and treatment guidelines are currently lacking, we decided to uh, retrospectively investigate a cohort of GLILD patients from two Italian referral centers, uh, University of Padova and Treviso Hospital, and uh, University of Rome, La Sapienza, in order to find uh, peculiar clinical manifestation and laboratory parameters that might, might help identify GLILD patients between CVID patients. It was a retrospective study. We enrolled the 100 CVID patients, 32 presented GLILD and 68 without GLILD. And in terms of demographics, the only difference we found was a slight uh, prevalence of the female sex between the GLILD patients. As expected, in terms of lung function, we, we found the features of uh, a restrictive disease and uh, of an impairment in gas transfer between uh, GL-ILD patients. Uh, but disease was not limited to the lung. In fact, we found uh, a significantly higher prevalence of bronchiectasis between GL-ILD patients, but also a significantly higher prevalence of splenomegaly, autoimmune cytopenia, and particularly thrombocytopenia, and hematologic cancers between GL-ILD patients if compared to controls. The systemic uh, nature of, of the disease was also confirmed by the FDG PET CT scan findings in the GLILD patients, where we can see we found 100% uh, of FDG uptake in the lung and the upper lymph nodes, in G uh, but also we found a significant uh, percentage of FDG uptake in the um, lower lymph nodes, those below the diaphragm in spleen, liver, bone, and, uh, and other organs. The HRCT scan of the lung highlight highlighted some peculiar features of GLALD that were uh, an increase in size and number of, uh, of mediastinal lymph nodes, the presence of signs of fibrosis and consolidation, but a significant, also a significantly higher uh, prevalence of nodular opacities, ground glass opacities, uh, um, smaller and bigger than five centimeters and linear opacities between gel ILD patients. Moving to the laboratory parameters, we found that gel ILD patients presented significantly lower levels of IgG and IgA at CVID diagnosis, and they also required a significantly higher dosage of IgG replacement therapy in order to keep uh, uh, IgG trough levels similar to the non-GL ILD patients. Moreover, in terms of B cell subpopulation, we found GL ILD patients presenting significantly higher circulating percentages 
of CD21 low activated B cells. So this considered, we, we, we can say that the lower the IgG level and the IgA level as CVID diagnosis, and the higher the CD21 low percentage uh, in the context of GLILD suspicion, the higher is the probability to diagnose uh, GLILD. And moreover, we found that splenomegaly presented a good sensitivity and specificity for GLILD with a high uh, negative predictive value. And then uh, cytopenia, and particularly the uh, autoimmune throm thrombocytopenia, uh, present a, a significantly high specificity and a good both positive predictive and negative predictive value for the diagnosis of GLILD. Finally, we took into account the bronchoalveolar lava fluid findings of 14 GLAD patients who underwent this procedure. This is not an uncommon procedure in CVID because um, many times the BAL is needed just in terms of um, bronchial toilette. Anyhow, in this GLAD patient, we found uh, significant lymphocytosis with a mean lymphocyte percentage of 30% of lymphocytes, which is uh, significant. Uh, of this patient, five presented also an increase uh, in CD4 to CD8 ratio and tend to have a stable disease, whilst nine of these patients present a normal or reduced CD4 to CD8 ratio, and they tend to present a progressive disease. Moreover, between these patients with a normal or reduced CD4 to CD8 ratio, uh, we found that uh, many of them, 50% of the 14 patients actually, presented an increase in the percentage of B cells in the BIL fluid. And when uh, B cell subpopulation analysis were, was performed in the BIL fluid, uh, this was possible in six patients, the B cells pres present in the, in the BIL were uh, predominantly CD21 low activated B cells. Between this patient, uh, five or six received the rituximab as, as a treatment of the GLILD. So, in conclusion, our study suggests that GLILD uh, might or should be considered a systemic disease rather than a simple isolated interstitial lung disease. Uh, GLILD patients tend to present lower IgG and IgA levels at CVID diagnosis. They tend to present an increase in the percentage of C21 low B cells at the time of glial suspicion or diagnosis. Uh, higher prevalence of splenomegaly and autoimmune cytopenias, in particular uh, autoimmune thrombocytopenia. And finally, uh, the analysis of bronchial lavage fluid might help the clinician the clinician not only in the differential diagnosis of the GLILD, so at the beginning of the history of GLILD, but also possibly in defining the uh, prognosis and maybe in driving a tailored therapeutic approach. Thanks for your kind attention, and let's meet in the live question and answer session. My name is Daniel Meyer, and I am a medical student in the laboratory of Kahn Botstuck at the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute for Rare and Undiagnosed Diseases in Vienna. And any questions can be submitted during the talk via the Q&A function. These questions will then be addressed in the live section at the end of the session. So, and thank you for the kind introduction, and I would like to thank all members of the committee for this opportunity, and I do not have any disclosures to make. <laughs> IL-21 receptor is a common gamma chain coupled interleukin receptor. So similar to other cytokine receptors, ligand binding to IL-21 receptor activates JAK-STAT signaling pathways that regulate immune cell fate and defector functions. IL-21 is predominantly produced by CD4 positive T cells, including T for liquor helper cells and Th17 cells. And biological actions include stimulating the proliferation and class switching of B cells, as well as inducing the maturation of NK cells and supporting the differentiation to T follicular helper cells and Th17 cells. In 2013 and 2014, the groups of Christoph Klein and Kahn Botstuck first demonstrated immunodeficiency caused by biallelic mutations in IL-21 receptor and IL-21 itself, respectively. 
And in these two studies, patients presented with combined immunodeficiency affecting T cells, B cells, and NK cell lineages. The case studies that followed these initial publications showed that patients with IL-21 receptor deficiency display a wide range of clinical symptoms, and they display heterogeneous immunophenotyping features and a variable response to, treat to treatment. In particular, one center reported exceptionally good outcome contrasting the collectively dismal prognosis observed in IL-21 receptor deficiency. Thus, there is a need to systematically compare the transplant regimens to optimize treatment response and survival. In a global multicentric collaborative approach, we studied the largest cohort of IL-21 receptor deficient patients to date to not only facilitate deeper understanding of these clinical challenges, but to also provide a more comprehensive understanding of the role of IL-21 receptor in immunopathology. So for our study, we followed up on six patients. We integrated published data from two deceased patients and we report findings of five novel patients, resulting in a total cohort size of 13 patients. The median age of disease onset was 2.5 years, and patients were diagnosed at a mean age of 8.5 years. Five patients are currently alive, whereas eight patients succumb to the course of disease or to transplant-related complications. Additionally, we identified two new biologic mutations in IL-21 receptor, so that now eight mutations are totally known to cause IL-21 uh, IL receptor deficiency. The most common features observed across all patients are, rec are recurrent respiratory bacterial infections requiring hospitalization, seen in 85% of all patients, and resulting in bronchiectasis in around half of these patients. <laughs> Cryptosporidiosis affected seven patients and was associated with high morbidity, leading to hepatic transplantation in two patients and hepaterenal syndrome in one patient. Also, one patient died due to a severe diarrhea caused by intestinal cryptosporidiosis. Fungal infections were seen in 46% of patients, with four patients being affected by esophageal or systemic candidiasis and three patients suffering from pneumocyst pneumocystic infections of the lung. Viral infections were noted in four patients and um, consisted of CMV pneumonitis, CMV retinitis, persistent norovirus infection, and also persistence of rubella vaccine. And in addition to these most common features, two novel unpublished patients exemplify the heterogeneity of the disease. Patient A initially presented with severe asthma and recurrent anaphylaxis, and as seen in previously published IL-21 receptor deficiency patients, patient A had increased IgE levels, albeit to a much more extreme extent. It was only later on that hypogamma globulinemia and recurrent infections manifested in this patient, who is now on omalizumab treatment. Genetic analysis revealed a homozygous stop mutation in the intracellular part of the IL-21 receptor protein. Patient B suffered too from respiratory disease and hepatomegaly and developed chronic granulomatose disease on the skin seen here in the image on the right, and the biopsy of the lesion revealed persistent infection with rubella virus, likely due to impaired immune response to live attenuated rubella vaccine. We also had the opportunity to perform systematic deep immunophenotyping at a centralized site in the novel patients and in five previously published patients, which revealed altered subsets in a variety of immune cell lineages. IL-21 receptor deficient patients have reduced propensities of T cells, of CD4 positive T cells, and of TH17 type T C cells. The latter indicating the um, or explaining the occurrence of fungal infections in these patients. And interestingly, both TH7 cell decrease and recurrent fungal infections are even more pronounced features in STAT3 deficiency, indicating that IL-21 receptor is a potent, but probably not the only activator of STAT3 signaling seen in antifungal immune defense. <laughs> these cells are increased in IL-21 receptor deficiency, but display a largely naive phenotype. And this and the drastic reduction seen in um, circulating T follicular helper cells explains that the few memory B cells that are being formed are actually unable to class switch into IgG and IgA, so that immunoglobulin G and A are decreased in 70 and 50% of our patients, respectively. <laughs> Stem cell transplantation in the setting of IL-21 receptor deficiency is complicated and challenging. In our cohort, six, six patients were transplanted and received grafts from fully matched donors. 
presence of cryptosporidium infections prior to conditioning is an important uh, negative prognostic marker and it was ob observed in three of the four patients that died due to transplant uh, um, that died due to transplant complications, but was seen in none of the patients that are that survived the transplantation and are in clinical remission. The only patients in remission are actually the two youngest patients of patients of the transplantation cohort. Furthermore, the high percentage of primary graft failures observed in this cohort advocates the use of bone marrow conditioning with increased myeloablation in this setting. However, to draw conclusions that are really statistically significant, more patients need to be collected in the future. In summary, IL-21 receptor deficiency is associated with a wide range of potentially lethal infections, but the spectrum of manifestations may be broader than what's currently understood. Patients may present with reduced propensities of terminally matured B cells and Th17 type cells, which contribute to the disease manifestation. And early stem cell transplantation prior to organ damage is imperative for treatment success because the presence of cryptosporidium heralds transplant complications. With this, I want to thank my supervisor, Khan Botsluk, for his support, and I want to thank my co-authors, Denise Chadash, Safa Barish, and Stuart Tange, who made this study possible. And I want to thank all the other collaborators that, from the numerous centers that contributed to this um, project. And lastly, I want to take the, thank the patients and their families for their help. Thank you very much.